Well, hi. Uh, <clears throat> that concludes our budget-based run adjustment training. <laughs> thank you for coming by. <clears throat> no, uh, everyone, thank you for your patience. Uh, we have been having some technical difficulties, but we'll... I've got nothing now. Oh, I'm getting word we're still having technical problems, so please hold on. First PowerPoint up. Okay. Hold on. Can you okay? Oh, why don't you say something? Can you hear me, but Barry? Hello, testing. Not through here though. So she can hear now and see the PowerPoint. Okay, Susan can hear it. Susan can hear, yeah. So Barry, can you hear or see anything? No. Okay. But Susan she can. She, she sees it and hears it. So. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I, one of my colleagues is, is remote and she can see it and hear it. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right, everybody. Thanks for your patience. We were having a, a lot of technical difficulties. <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about uh, budget-based run adjustments for project-based Section 8 properties. And um, just a little housekeeping, make sure your phones are set on silent or uh, vibrate if you're here uh, in San Francisco with us. Uh, our agenda for today, uh, I'll just briefly uh, talk about who Kahi and CGI even are. Um, we'll talk about HAP contracts and how they actually relate to um, doing a budget-based run adjustment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about rent comparability studies as well, because they also uh, play into doing uh, a budget-based rent adjustment. And then we'll actually dive in and talk about uh, what you need to submit to us, the PBCA, um, how it is that we actually evaluate what it is that you send to us, and how we determine your final rents using the Appendix 5. Um, and then at the end, uh, we'll definitely try and save some time <clears throat> excuse me, for questions. Um, but uh, since I actually think we're now a little bit more pressed for time, um, if you can try and save your questions to the end, that'd be great. Okay, uh, so who is CAHI and who is CGI? CAHI, <clears throat> California Affordable Housing Initiatives, is actually an instrumentality of the Oakland Housing Authority, and um, they were set up to uh, help administer housing programs for low and moderate income families uh, in Northern California. So CAHI actually holds the ACC, or the Performance Base uh, Contract Administration contract, um, with uh, U.S. Housing uh, and Urban Development. CAHI partnered with CGI, which is okay, <laughs> which is uh, actually a French acronym for Conciliers General Informatique. Uh, I understand it. Uh, <laughs> it uh, translates to General Information Consultants. Um, but uh, CGI is a IT and business process services company with about 70,000 employees uh, around the world. Um, here in Northern California, as well as other jurisdictions uh, in the United States, for example, Ohio and New York, we have uh, similar partnerships and administer the project-based Section 8 programs there as well. Um, so at least here in California, we've been uh, together with CAHI doing this uh, since October 2004, so um, almost 11 years. Okay. So let's talk about HAP contracts and what they even have to do with your budget-based rent adjustment that you're considering. Um, well, I'm sure you're all familiar, but just uh, really quickly to level set, uh, your housing assistance payment contract or HAP contract, it's an agreement between you, us, the PBCA, and HUD, and they usually last from about one to 20 years. And um, just like any other contract, it outlines your obligations of uh, delivering affordable housing, and you'll follow these rules, and in turn, you'll get this amount of subsidy. Um, now, uh, the things I want to hit on is that um, back in 1997, Congress enacted the Multi-Family Assisted Housing I can't see my PowerPoint, <laughs> Rental Assistance Act, uh, MARA, and uh, that went into effect, I believe, uh, in probably early 2000. Um, I've looked at our portfolio, and I think there's only one pre-MARA contract left, so I'm guessing 99.9% .9 of you in this room have a post-MARA contract. Why is that even important to you? Uh, MARA uh, implemented uh, a couple of more, um, uh, I guess, uh, what would you call it? 
uh, things that uh, you needed to do uh, in your contract um, requirements. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, the first was about funding, which um, we don't really need to get into, but basically you do have to do a rent adjustment every year, uh, where in the past, if you were pre-MARA, you didn't have to. But more importantly for you guys, it imposed comparability. And when I say comparability, I mean rent comparability studies. Um, there are actually six options that you could renew under MARA, depending on your circumstances and situation. Um, and actually the sixth one is you're opting out of the program, so that's not really uh, one we want to talk about. Uh, but uh, depending on those options, um, it dictated what kind of rent adjustments you could do in subsequent years and when and if you needed a rent comparability study. So we'll cover that uh, a little bit more in just a second. Um, MARA. Uh, I think I've already covered this, and I have to apologize to anyone who's watching on the webcast. Um, my PowerPoint uh, is super tiny, so I can barely see where I'm at. I am. Okay. Um, let's talk about subsequent years for your run adjustments. So, for example, if you um, – well, actually, a little bit of trivia. Does anyone – can anyone name the six options uh, for post mara contract rules? Come on. <laughs> It is, yeah. Is there is Davin around? Is there any way to? Okay, all right. So we're still having some technical problems in San Francisco. Sorry, folks on the webcast. Uh, <laughs> there's uh, six options, and I'll name them for you. Option one is markup to market. Option two is rent at or below market. Option three actually has two sub choices, I guess. Uh, there's option three A, which is a uh, Office of Affordable Housing Preservation light contract. Ah, yes, much better. Okay, option 3B, which is um, the full restructuring of your loans. Uh, then there's option 4, where you're exempt from going to OHAP. Uh, and then there's option 5, where you uh, may be in a uh, plan of action or have some kind of long-term use agreement with HUD. And then, as I mentioned, there's option 6, where you're actually just leaving the project-based Section 8 program altogether. Um, but depending on what option you are in now, um, you may not even have a choice of doing a budget-based run adjustment. So, you know, before you put in a ton of work on putting a budget together, make sure you know what option you're under. And um, it even matters what year you're in as well. Uh, can anyone tell me the significance if, um, let's say, you're option two, but you're in a sixth year of your multi-year contract? Yeah, you need a comp study. Yeah. You need a comp study. You can't even do your budget or an OCAF. You need to go get a comp study, and your rents will be set to the market. So um, it's really important that, one, you understand what your contract even allows or what contract you're under, two, what year you're in of your multi-year contract, and three, you know, do I even need to get an RCS? Um, so let's talk about RCSs really fast. It's a rent study. It compares your units and amenities and all that good stuff to other properties in the vicinity. And just really quickly, I mean, the whole reason for getting an RCS is so that there's a level playing field. Um, HUD and market owners and you, uh, you know, a subsidized uh, 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 housing owner, will be getting rents that uh, only the market will bear. No one has a certain advantage. No one's getting overpaid or underpaid. So that's really the point of the RCS. And just some good things to know, uh, you know, RCSs are generally good for five years, and you may not always need to commission an appraiser, actually. Um, there are two alternatives uh, that might be possible for getting an RCS. One is um, if your proposed adjusted gross rents are still going to be 75% or less than uh, the current FMRs in your area, you don't need to get an RCS. And uh, if you have a mixed property, so let's say you have 100 units of um, – you know, Section 8 units, and then you have a hundred, another 100 uh, market units, and they're more or less identical, you can use your own property as an RCS. So I've only, I think, ever seen that happen once in the last 11 years, though. All right, so why so much focus on the RCSs? Well, as I mentioned before, um, you know, you might have to do a mark to comparables. And uh, more importantly, if you were option four, uh, when you renewed under option four, you didn't have to get an RCS. Instead, you turned in a budget and an OCAF to us, the PBCA, and we awarded you the lower of those two rents. Now, again, maybe you're some years down the road and you're saying we really would like to do a budget. Well, if you're in option four, 
you can do the budget, but you need to get an RCS to go with it, and your rents will be capped um, to those market rents. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if you're in year six, 11, or 16, um, since we do have a lot of 20-year uh, long-term HAP contracts, um, most likely you will have to get an RCS and get marked to comps. So um, things to keep in mind. All right, so finally, I'm going to talk about budget-based rent adjustments. You've looked at your contract, you're good to go, you don't need an RCS, or you're not going to get marked to comps at least, and um, you want to submit a budget. Um, you know, some of the reasons that you might want to do that is uh, an OCAF increase just isn't enough to uh, cover your expenses. Um, maybe you're having some financial difficulties at your property, um, or if you're renewing um, uh, uh, under option two, you just you actually have to get an RCS. So there are just HUD requirements for that as well. Um, but let's talk about a complete package. Um, if you are wanting to uh, get a budget-based rent adjustment, first you need to put together a cover letter for us, um, us being the PBCA, explain what kind of rent increase uh, is needed and the desired percent increase and the date in the increase will be uh, implemented, and describe um, you know, some of the reasons of why you need this budget-based rent increase. There's also the budget worksheet that you need to fill in, and I think, at least for the people here in San Francisco, you have a blank copy of one of the first page, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, but that needs to be completed. Uh, we'll need a narrative and documentation for any line items that you're asking for that are 5% and $500 more than last year's audited figures. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. You'll also need to provide to us an owner certification regarding purchasing practices and reasonableness of expenses. Utility allowance analysis. Um, I'm sure you're all dying to ask me a ton of questions about UAs because there was a new HUD notice from headquarters, uh, I think it's 2015-04. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, we actually have some questions ourselves, the PBCA, and we've uh, uh, asked them of HUD HQ. So um, I don't want to get too deep into uh, utility allowances right now, um, but I will say that, and it's probably nothing you don't already know if you've read it yourself, but um, on the go-forward UAs, um, every three years you'll need to do a baseline, and the sample size that you've been used to, at least here in Northern California, um, the sample is going to be much bigger. You'll have to provide a larger sample to us. And uh, in years two and three, uh, it's going to be kind of like an OCAF. You'll get uh, your UA adjusted by a certain factor. And um, for decreases, um, those actually have to be stepped over the uh, three-year period. So um, if it's more than, I think, a certain percentage uh, of a decrease, um, you can only go down by so much the following year and then decrease it uh, fully uh, in the third year. But um, that's pretty general, and I'm sorry, I actually don't have any more specifics uh, right now. I'd hate to send you uh, and give you any wrong information. So, But once we do find out, it'll definitely be published on our website so you guys can um, um, get as much information on it and what you need to do uh, as possible. Okay, uh, so UAs. Uh, you'll need a copy of the tenant notice and comment period, and uh, you'll need to provide to us an owner certification that you... Um, actually posted the tenant comment notice and let tenants uh, have their say if they needed to. Okay. There's still more for the complete package. Uh, you need a status report on the project's implementation of its current energy con uh, conservation plan, and then a uh, HUD form 9250 if you're contemplating a change in your R for R, uh, reserve for replacement. Um, if you are, you also need to provide, a, I think, a five-year reserve analysis to go along with that as well. Okay, so those are all, I think that's 99.9% .9 of the documents you need to submit to us. Um, we do reserve the right to ask you for something else if necessary, but um, that should cover it. Um, the budget worksheet, uh, this is probably one of the most important pieces of uh, information that you provide to us. Um, if you're here in San Francisco and you're looking at it, um, it has the most recent audited financial figures in the first column, the one for this, uh, to the left. And then it has your year-to-date actual expenses, excuse me, <clears throat> in the unaudited column. That's the column in the middle. And then it has the projected figures, basically what you're asking for in your budget uh, in the third column. Uh, make sure you sign it and date it as well. Um, and uh, document those expenses. So 
what we're looking at when you submit it to us is we're taking that first column and that third column and seeing what the percent and um, uh, difference is. So if we're seeing anything that's, one, greater than 5%, and then it's also more than $500, you can bet that we will be looking for your explanation. And if it's not in there, that will delay the rent adjustment because we will go right back to you and say, why do you want this? Um, and we also, again, reserve the right task for any documentation on any line, line item, regardless of the percentage change. But again, we're, we're most focused on 5% and $500 increases. Okay, and some examples of the supporting documentation that you can provide in your package to us, um, you know, might be estimates or contracts or invoices from your vendors. Um, maybe you hired some new staff, um, so uh, changes in payroll. Uh, you know, something from the utility companies saying, or insurance providers saying, you know, rates are going up, stuff like that. Some of the common errors that we do see, um, Owners are supposed to submit a complete package 120 days before your anniversary. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, oftentimes, just for a variety of reasons, we don't get that. And, um, you know, I can delay your rent adjustment. Um, you know, non compliant utility analyses. Again, I will get to the new one eventually, uh, but at least in the past um, with old uh, UAs, um, oftentimes we'd get samples where the um, utility bills were way too old, they were beyond the 18 month uh, period or um, we didn't get enough of a sample. So that, that was a, a big uh, barrier to getting things done. Uh, other common area, uh, common errors, um, project actually, uh, with what they submitted, it doesn't warrant a rent increase. Um, and sometimes we actually plug in all your numbers and we don't even adjust anything. You're actually getting a negative uh, rent adjustment. So um, we'll touch on that uh, in a minute as well. So. Uh, here's just some other common errors, R for R. You need to have your five-year reserve analysis. Okay. Uh, you know, a great resource is the HUD handbook, 4350.1, Chapter 7. Um, it very clearly describes uh, really the whole process of putting a budget together and what the PBCA or HUD is looking for. So certainly recommend you uh, have that nearby. Um, you know, put it under your pillow and sleep, at, sleep on it. <laughs> It's a great read. Okay. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit more about the budget worksheet. So as I described earlier, you know, you have your actual audited costs in column one, your year to date in column two, the middle column, and then what you're asking for in column three. And we are looking at the actual audited costs and comparing them to what um, you're asking for in this upcoming year. And we're looking for the reasons why you feel um, you need an increase or, or even a decrease in some cases in some of those line items. Um, so here's the budget worksheet for folks who might be on the web watching. This is uh, what we've been referring to. Okay, so how do we, the PBCA, review your budget? Um, really, we're just looking for, is this necessary? And have you provided adequate support for it? And does it seem reasonable for the time and place and circumstances? So if you're submitting a budget to us and you, your property is here in the Bay Area and you're asking for, you know, $2,000 in snow removal, <laughs> probably going to, actually, you know, with the drought, if you're in Tahoe, we'll probably be asking you that too. But, um, but you know, uh, it's kind of common sense. Um, let me give you a real life example. So um, we had an owner actually of a pre-Mara because they can do budgets as well. Uh, submit a special adjustment requesting a 300% increase in his insurance uh, for the property. Can, any, can anyone here think of any reason why or any circumstance that that would be considered reasonable? Well, it's, um, Close, yeah. Decided to take uh, earthquake insurance. <clears throat> yeah, right? <laughs> okay. JP, don't answer because I know you've seen this one before. <laughs> but um, uh, it was approved. This property was actually located in Florida, which is where we're also the PBCA. You know, seven months after Katrina, the owner had submitted three bids for insurance, and 300% was the cheapest. And uh, some insurers, insurers weren't even providing insurance anymore to uh, homeowners in Florida. So for the time, place, circumstances, it was absolutely necessary and reasonable, and of course, we approved it. Okay, so again, that was the lesson. You know, anything that's reasonable and necessary will be approved and you know providing us the backstory, the detailed support and documents and the reasons why it helps make that determination uh, easier for us and you. Okay. So processing uh, further 
uh, more on processing. Um, once we've looked at all of your line items, um, we actually start plugging things into the Appendix 5. And this is the Appendix 5 worksheet that's um, in the 4350.1 Chapter 7. I have just want a show of hands, at least for the people in San Francisco, do you guys use this at all when you're putting together your budget? Okay, see some people, but majority, yeah. Okay. Are you talking about the appendix reference or looking at the form? The appendix five is actually, yeah, the form. It's almost like um, it's almost like a tax form. You know, it says fill in this and then take the product of A and B. Yeah, and we have a spreadsheet that we can help. Okay, that does that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, because what we, again, as I mentioned before, we'll, we'll get this whole budget package from an owner. You know, we won't even adjust anything. Everything they're asking for seems reasonable. We plug it in the appendix five and... It's probably not what they were looking for. So let's talk about what this Appendix 5 actually does, this uh, mysterious thing. OK. So it's actually a calculation worksheet that considers a property's vacancy, distribution, management fees, debt service, and other income in conjunction with budgeted expenses to determine what rent increase or reduction is needed to maintain current operations. Um, so during processing, this worksheet, when complete, provides the maximum allowable rent increase or level of decrease. Uh, we're held to the maximum allowable rent increase, even if the owner uh, requests more. So how does this whole thing work? Uh, kind of just a 10,000-foot overview. So we calculate all your allowed expenses. We do that with your budget worksheet. Um, you know, if we feel we need to make some adjustments, you know, you're asking for, I don't know, a 15% increase in something, and the support you gave us um, isn't that great. You might say, well, maybe they deserve 10%. Anyway, after we go through that whole exercise, um, we plug the allowed expenses into the uh, Appendix 5. Uh, the Appendix 5 also um, takes into consideration your reserve for replacement, your debt service, your distribution, um, if you have any at your property, and then management fees. And uh, matches that all together, and it comes out with a total cash, less management requirement. So you have that number. So hold on to that number for a second. It will calculate your rent potential by applying the management fee uh, vacancy factor. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, and then after that, it will des derive an increased percentage based on your current rent potential and the newly calculated rent potential after all those numbers get kind of uh, thrown together. So we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. So um, again, this is maybe just a different way to, to look at it that might be a little bit easier on the eyes. Uh, we take your allowed expenses. We actually subtract out the management fee. We add in reserves, add in the debt service, add in return net income reserves add in any authorized distributions, and with that, we get the total cash need, less management fees. So you're probably wondering what happens to our management fees. Um, there's actually a factor that uh, uh, is used. So let's say, for example, your management fee is 7.5%, and um, you're a family property. You're allowed, at least based on the Appendix 5, to have a 5% um, vacancy rate. Would anyone, uh, does anyone know what property would have a 0% vacancy rate allowed for budgets? 202. Yeah, 202s, elderly properties. Just, um, you know, I think most folks are aging in place, not a whole lot of turnover. Um, at any rate, so we take 100%. So for your management fee factor, we take 100% minus 7.5, and we come out with 92.5. Uh, with a 5% vacancy factor, we take 100% minus 5, we get 95. Um, we put your management, 92.5 uh, factor, divided by your vacancy, so in this case 95, and we come out with 87.88 for your management vacancy factor. That's actually applied now to your total cash, less management. So, um, you know, you can think of like 100,000 divided by point. 8788, and you come up with whatever that number is. So that gives you your, your uh, rent potential, but we actually need to take out your income now. Um, and income, I'm talking about uh, garage, I think laundry and vending, 
Um, there's a couple others, stores and commercial. So we take that out of uh, uh, the um, that uh, rent potential as well. And that results in our authorized potential. So <clears throat> we can finally figure out what your rent increase is now by taking your new authorized potential and dividing it by the current rent potential and then subtracting one. And that will give us our percent increase or decrease. Um, that percentage is actually applied to your current rents. And then the same uh, uh, ratio is applied to any 236 rents you might have at the property as well. So um, this Appendix 5, you know, uh, you know, I, I've always wondered, because you know, I'm not an owner agent, but I've, uh, I've really wondered um, when owners and agents are putting together their budgets if they've factored this in, because it, it, it does have a big impact on what the final rent uh, can be. And uh, that's why I was asking earlier. Um, so uh, you know, there are times where the rents are actually decreased. And if you're doing an option two, um, your rents will most likely be decreased if uh, this is what you turn into us. Um, same with an option four. Uh, you know, we're taking the lesser of your budget or OCAF at renewal time. And um, obviously, if the budget's going to be a, a, a negative, um, we're going with those lower rents. So those are uh, decreases and actually greater than 5% overall increases are subject to HUD's review and approval. Um, but if HUD signs off and says, yep, it is what it is, um, we will put your final rents onto a new rent schedule, send them out to you. Um, you do have the opportunity to appeal that if you, if you disagree. And um, we usually have, or not usually, we, uh, if we do receive an appeal, we assign it to someone who's arm's length, so another uh, asset manager at Kahi who had nothing to do with um, the initial review. And um, they take a look at it and make their determination. Um, if you still don't like it, uh, you can go to uh, HUD for the second and final uh, review and appeal. Um, after you get through all that and you finally do sign the rent schedule, um, you send us the fully executed rent schedule. We do some funding stuff, and the whole process is done. And you can um, uh, submit for a gross rent change on your vouchers. So um, that kind of takes us whole, through the whole process of doing a budget. Is there anything I can answer for you guys? Or? Yeah. Yes. Um, in a situation where an owner has acquired a property and they put in substantial equity to acquire it, mm -hmm. They usually are hoping, if they don't have their own management company, to have some distribution in order to cover their own overhead and costs and perpetuate their business. How is it considered that there would be some money to distribute? That seems like a zero-sum calculation. Oof. <laughs> uh, OK, so if I, well, does you, can you hear it online, or you need to? Need OK. It. Here, maybe it might be better if I <laughs> move this to you. <clears throat> In this calculation, it appears that it's a zero-sum calculation where there's no net earnings. It's basically designed to zero out to where it covers expenses. How is an owner who invests substantial equity to acquire or maintain a property to budget for any form of distribution, given that the budget doesn't seem to account for that? Okay. Of course, that was a hard question. <laughs> so, um, that to me actually is sounding like um, I think we have a special circumstance where we do um, that be a capital repairs if yeah, a we can do that too. Yeah. yeah we also have in the past we've also um, allowed like uh, construction management fees if if it's you know a one time like you said acquisition and rehab mm -hmm. um, where, where the owner is the construction manager and, and we'll allow that for a uh, limited predetermined time frame, usually t two years, typically 18 months to two years. Um, but yeah, we don't build in uh, a surplus cash cushion. Because so. things have changed quite a bit with LIHTC recaps, right. where now there's right. no gap money available. So typically there needs to be some equity infusion now to do one of those deals, let's say $5 million um, from whoever the sponsor is. Right. And then there's no ability for them to get any return on investment under this type of scenario. It's going to discourage future investment. Right. Typically, though, the HUD will, in development, HUD will um, build in something, at least for the short term. Right. 
And I was going to say, I mean, would that play into um, a lot of the early uh, terminations and refinancings that have been going on, especially here in the Bay Area? Correct. Yeah. Exactly. So um, you probably know more than I do, but I think HUD um, production um, works with, I guess, the developers and the, the investors to factor that in. Yeah. It works up front. It's just the longer term hold is where it becomes a problem. You reach year eight, nine, ten, and the owners are saying, wow, I'm getting a zero return. We've got five million parked in here, and we need to sustain operations. Um, but typically, those kind of properties, once the you know the uh, rehab's done, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen, in fact, the vast majority of them then at, at year two or three will come in and they'll they'll be more than eligible for a markup to market situation. And then and then there is no budget hold you know holding you. It's just the, it. the comps. There's, there's but you're bringing because because you're bringing a property up to the comps, right. presumably. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, when you were talking about the comp study, yes. you mentioned that although you've rarely seen it, that there can sometimes be a comp within your building. Um, I have a lot of hope sixes. Okay. And so there are project based Section 8 and ACC and 50 and 60% AMI tax credit. Wow. Okay. Um, in the same building, uh -huh. right? And across the street are $2 million homes. So the comp within the building makes a whole lot of sense, but I didn't even know that was possible. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, I'm sorry. I'll oh, repeat the question. Uh, so the question is, uh, uh, we have a person here who has a building. Mm -hmm. um, part of it is project-based Section 8, and then it sounds like uh, some of it is also low-income housing tax credits. And then also across the street even are just plain old market units that are... Market units going for $4,000. Okay, market units going for $4,000 a month, which is a lot. Um, and the question revolves around uh, the alternative to the rent comparability study, um, which was, as we talked about earlier, is if you have a mixed property, um, you may be able to use uh, your, your market units as your comparables. Um, the best thing I can... Uh, uh, do like right here is to suggest you look really closely at chapter nine of the section eight renewal guide that ex that explains in detail um, the the requirements for rent comparability studies and also the alternatives as well okay. so yeah Thanks. and if you still have more questions you're more than free to to email me <laughs> and I'll get someone else to answer it <laughs> okay <laughs> all right uh, any more questions so, uh, JP. So I'm just curious. I know there's a, a lot of different expenses that are not allowed by HUD. You know, for example, the DNA cost is not really acceptable, and some sort of uh, staff, you know, cost like during parties and stuff. Do you have a list of those um, items that are not allowed in the in the line items? Uh, so the question is. Um, there are some unallowable costs uh, to be considered, I guess, in the in the budget-based run adjustment, I guess, evaluation. Um, and the question is, is there a list of those, I guess, uh, unallowable expenses? And I personally have not seen one, um, and I'm looking to Robin, and she has not either. So, gotcha. yeah. So we're just waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. There is a list of allowable. Mm -hmm. um, and I forget where exactly it is in the handbook, mm. but I, it's pretty detailed. Maybe chapter seven, I guess. Yeah, that would be the, the best place to start looking. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. And we are not able to get questions from the. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for your time, and uh, enjoy. Again, I'm Robin Thompson. I'm a project manager here in the San Francisco HUD office. 
Um, I formerly was for Sacramento, so if you know from me from there, it's the same person. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, uh, rent increases in uh, project-based um, assistance contracts, PRACs. And uh, so, you know, if you have one of those, you know you have that. Some of you might have both a HAP and a PRAC. Um, but anyway, so we're going to talk about that today. Um, I'm your facilitator. Um, your HUD project manager, um, you should know who that is, and it is a by project uh, assignment, so you might actually have several that you work with. If you're not certain, we've been shuffling the deck chairs around a lot lately, even between states. Um, so it, if you don't know for sure, this is my direct line. Give me a call. I'll look it up for you. It'll be easier. Um, and then we have a new PRAC funding coordinator named Julie Eklund. She's been with us for about eight or ten months now. And uh, she specifically, she's the one that's going to send you out your contracts to sign. Um, she does the rent, uh, if you haven't put in a rent schedule or it needs to be changed, she helps us out with those. She also put, inputs all your pra uh, tracts data. Okay. Be kind to Julie if you want to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is our supervisory team. Okay, program eligibility, uh, these are for Section 2, 2 and 811 with PRACs. Um, of course, there's the uh, requirements for both. If you don't have those properties, then you might want to go and have an early lunch because that's what we're talking about today. Um, here's your tools of the trade. I've decided to set this up. I was thinking one day, the, you know, we, we know this stuff is dry as a stick. I, I, I understand this. I do it all day. So having said that, I thought, you know, why would people – stand in line for two hours to get on a ride at Disneyland, and they don't want to wait 20, 10 minutes at the grocery store. And it's because Disneyland is fun. So I'm going to try to make this fun. <laughs> and what we're going to do is I'm going to make it like a recipe. So it's a little bit easier to follow. You can look back at it later and, and just change your mind from work to baking. Okay, so make it nice. So you, first, your tools of the trade. This is like your bowls and skillets and stuff. You have HUD Handbook 4350.1, which Charles was talking about. This is the granddad of the multifamily handbooks. Um, it was written in 1992 as our last revision. Some of you probably weren't even born yet. Um, but it's still, it's a, it's a good, um, like you said, it's a good pillow. But we want Chapter 7, and that's because that goes over uh, our budget-based uh, rent increases, and we've been using it, obviously, for 20 years. Uh, then we have our housing notice 0217 that goes over PRAC renewals. Okay. Then 4350.3, another three inch manual of doom, but we're only talking about just the tracks and the tenant requirements, and you'll only need that if you have a problem in those two areas. Okay. And then HUD Clips is, of course, our online and, and phone form system. And our new centralized mailbox, we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? So PRAC renewal recipe is, uh, so to renew, you go one year at a time. Oh, we should have taken these out. And we need it four months in advance. I'm sorry, we should have taken these out. These were supposed to be taken out, so I apologize. Let's go past these real quickly. Okay, rent increase ingredients. Here we go. Okay, so there's eight ingredients. We're doing this like a like a recipe. There's eight ingredients, and that's not too bad. I have recipes that have 30, so this isn't bad, right? It's only eight. <laughs> so you start with the cover letter that that this, it's a summary of your budgetary needs. We're going to talk about each of these individually in a minute. Okay, so for time, let's go pretty, pretty quickly. Your budget worksheet, uh, the explanation of the line item increases. A uh, copy of the notice to tenants, the uh, executed copy of the owner's uh, certification regarding, regarding purchasing practices and reasonableness of expenses, your rent schedule, uh, your HUD form 9250, if applicable. This is more like um, you can leave in or out the cayenne pepper, okay? If you wanted, if, if you need an increase in that. It may or may not be in there. And then the utility allowance, and that's like sugar and the sugar cookies. We have to have a utility allowance, okay? Utility analysis. Okay, so the cover letter should briefly summarize um, the amount of the increase, why it's needed, the date it's effective, and any proposed changes. So this is real briefly. I mean, it's two paragraphs. Don't put a lot of time into it. But we would like to see the percentage 
and the amount. And if there's a real big, we'd like a 22% increase, we're going to hire a service coordinator. Okay, just a cause and effect, real quick. Okay, further guidance is in Chapter 7. They actually have a sample in there. Uh, the budget worksheet, uh, Charles already went over. It's the same one. Uh, it is appendix in Appendix D or 4D. Um, on HUD clips, it is a PDF file. It is not fillable there, but it is widely available in the industry. I think AMA has it as a fillable and savable PDF. So save yourself some time. Use that one. Uh, the first column is the statement that should reflect the statement of profit and loss that you sent to HUD. A couple of times, it, typically, I mean, why reinvent the wheel? Your auditor's already done that, column one. But once in a while, I will get one that's completely different. I'm going to send it back, okay? That 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 should reflect what, what you've sent to us in, in, in the FAST system. Column two, please put it at the top how many months that reflects, because that's a partial year. And that, people kind of question that. It really is a good indicator, especially if, uh, like three or four years ago, there was a big bump in workers' comp claim, um, insurance. Um, so this is a, a, a good tool for us to see, oh, yeah, they did. Their sewer fee did really go up last year. You know, It helps with your explanation. So that's basically what that's for. And then uh, the variances between columns one and three must be explained. OK. OK. Uh, uh, ingredient number three is an explanation of the line item increases. We'd like to see an explanation for all of them, especially if they're really large. Um, some verification forms would be really good. For instance, for our last example, if your workers' comp went up 30%, just send us a copy of the, the declaration page. You know, that's, that's easy, right? Um, there is actually a comprehensive sample in Chapter 7 of 4350.1. I didn't even know that was there until a couple of months ago. So there you go. <laughs> I learned something. But yeah, there is in there, and it gives you an idea of how to write that up, OK? Uh, ingredient number four is a copy of the notice to the tenants. Yes, I would like to see an actual copy of the notice to the tenants, because chances are you're just photocopying it. And so just send us a copy. But we need to know uh, how it was distributed. So, like there, I have a, I have a, um, an example. We put it in the laundry room and post it on everybody's door. We mailed it to everybody. However, you did that, we need to know that. Okay. But uh, and a little bit more about the tenant notification. It is required. There's a 30-day comment period. After the 30-day comment period ends, we'd like to see it then. If you send it in before that. We're not going to look at it until the 30-day comment period ends. So don't try to be a sneaky peep. We can't do that, OK? And please try to make sure you get it out timely. Because if you send out the 30-day comment period supersedes your, in, your uh, renewal date, you know, you're not going to get your, your you know, you're going to have a, a, a kick up in your vouchers. So. Oops. OK. And, Let's see where we at. Okay, number five is the executed copy of the owner's certification regarding purchasing practices and reasonableness of expenses. This is appendix three in chapter seven. Just it has to be in there, okay? Um, and then the rent schedule. Also, uh, a PDF form in clips, also or high clips, also widely available. See AMA as a fillable PDF again. Um, part B, and we're going to go, I ha actually have a slide of this. Part B should coincide with your original appraisal form, which is HUD 9294464. Yeah. And uh, on page two, we do need you to list your current board members. And if any of those board members are new, please check with us and make sure that we have 2530 clearance on them. That's a pretty typical uh, thing that we find out later. Uh oh. OK. Oops. So this is what the top of the rent schedule is going to look like. Thompson Park Apartments is a beautiful property. Um, really, real easy. I'll make sure in column five you have the effective date of the um, utility allowance. Not often, but sometimes that is a different date. You know. And then we're going to look at column B. Um, so if it had a range, refrigerator, air conditioner, basically those things, if 
if I see, especially I'm from Sac, most of my properties are in Sacramento. If I see mm -hmm. that there's no air conditioning in there anymore, we're, you're going to get a phone call. So um, we need to make sure that, that you are maintaining everything that was there originally. And if you don't, we need to know why, you know. Uh, again, the same thing with the utilities. What's paid for, you check. In addition, in services and facilities, if it's checked, that means you're paying for it. Um, I've had prop problems with that, uh, with parking specifically. If you see there under services and facilities, I've checked parking. At Thompson Park Apartments, we have free parking. Um, if you have paid parking, don't check that put it down in part C as, the, as something that's a fee and, and, and listed as a fee, okay? You know, it, it's, it, it, you know, people, oh yeah, we have a parking lot and they check that. But what you're checking there is you're saying that you're, that's free. And honestly, if somebody came in six months later, a tenant and said, they're charging me for parking. Even if you've always charged that, if the rent schedule says you don't, then we're gonna have to, until that uh, rent schedule expires, you're gonna have to give that person free parking. So, I want to do that. Not in Sacra San Francisco for sure. Okay. Is there any questions about the rent schedule before we go on? Okay. Yes. Hello, I'm Robbie. Yeah. Uh, do we sign the rent schedule? Where yes, on the back. The back. Okay. Yes, on the back there's a place for the owner to sign. It's on the <clears throat> top right signature line. Typically, that's going to be, you know, in, for a nonprofit, it's going to be one of the board members, unless. Um, the owner, the, the management agent has been given, you know, that capacity. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the back, but. Okay. Uh, now we're going to talk about my favorite, funds authorization 9250. Now we're not going to talk about it actually about a release from the reserve for replacement, although what we're going to talk about pertains to both. But what we're talking about here is asking for an increase in the amount of the monthly reserve for replacement, which is a budgetary expense. If you think that it's not ramping up or you you know, you know, uh, have done a PCNA or the property's 10 years old and you're thinking, those roofs and you're gonna be needed replaced in a couple of years and, and the reserves are just not going to address it, then we need to, to bump that up and that would be part of your rent increase. And it can be substantial if you haven't you know, kept track on that. Um, so if the budget increase is a reserve for replacement deposit, then we have to have the HUD 9250. Uh, again, it's widely available as a fillable PDF. HUD doesn't have it fillable. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna stress this, we, I'm gonna have a picture in just a minute, but this is a pet peeve of Robin, so you're gonna get a little extra training on this. The name and the address in the up top left that says mortgagee, that's the financial institution that's holding the money. Please make that the name and address. And down in the bottom left, there's the one that says mortgagor. Whoever you want to get a copy of that in your organization, get their name and address in there. Okay? So let's take a peek. So here's Thompson Park Apartments again. Um, they have Wells Fargo, 123 First Street. Okay, so it's a full address. And then down here in the bottom, Soaring Robin Property Management, that's who's going to get the, the, the copy for the owner, okay? Does anybody know why we do it that way? Any ideas at all? Because we're going to fold it to where that goes through the envelope. We really, honestly, this is going to sound really kind of mm -hmm. chintzy, but we really don't have time to do cover letters anymore. So, you know, we're going to fold it, and if it's incorrect, we're going to get it back. Because, <laughs> you know, like I have what, 73 properties in my portfolio. So anytime we can cut corners, thanks, helpful, please do that for us. So yeah, so that should be there and then we'll make sure it gets to the right place. And down here, that should have that and we fold it to where that goes through the uh, there, that your, your um, uh, copy of it and everything's great. If that's not like that, then we give it to our friends. <laughs> I'm sorry. The levity. Okay, and finally, ingredient number eight is the utility analysis. Basically the same thing that Charles again was talking about. This is only if you have a utility allowance, but probably everyone here does. Does anyone not have a utility allowance? Yeah, I have, I have a few properties in Alaska that do not, but for the most part, I think most of our pracs are written with utility allowances. Okay, um, so, uh, well, we got, this is wrong here. We have the old Tom Lanzombrato memo. It's actually now, 
uh, the new housing notice that just came out a couple of weeks ago. I apologize. We, I guess we got the wrong uh, stack in here. But anyway, um, talks about that. There's 10%, you know, so it's the 10%, no, less than three, not more than 20. Um, somebody called me and said, well, we've only got two two bedroom units in our property. Use them both. Don't make up a third one. Don't pretend there's a third one. <laughs> That's okay. We get it. Um, no, yeah, and again, not more than 18 months old. All of the, it should be in the same time frame. So if you have studios and one bedrooms, you know, make sure they're all February to, you know, June of 2015. Um, vacancies are not included for obvious reasons. That's going to really skew things, and your tenants will be really upset with you. And there is a sample Excel spreadsheet available. Check with your property manager. A lot of our bigger management companies, you guys have already come up with your own spreadsheets. That's fine. We do have one. If you don't want to reinvent the wheel, let us know, and we'll send that out to you. And it looks like that. So it, already, it averages it out for you. Pretty simple spreadsheet. Like I said, most of you probably, your accounting departments have already done that, or you've done it on, on your own. But we do have it if you need it. Okay. And then you just combine all the ingredients and submit them to your preheated hot office. Isn't that a nice kitchen? I like that picture. Okay. Um, real quick, I wanted to st uh, just uh, touch real quickly. We've got like two minutes. So I want to talk about aligning your project, your PRAC renewal to your fiscal year end. Um, I have several of my properties that I, I, I suggest it, but sometimes we just don't have time at the time. So this might be a good opportunity to, to offer it up. We can, if your fiscal year is, say, it's calendar year, it's uh, January 1st to December 31st, but your um, PRAC renews March 1st, we can align those and just talk to your project manager about aligning them. And what we will do is one year we will only renew the contract. Let's say in this example it's March 1st. We will renew it one year for March 1st to December 31st. The following year, then it'll be January 1st. The problem with that is you're only allowed one rent increase per 12-month period, so you're going to have to kind of, you know, figure out which side of it you want to forego the rent increase. In that, in that um, instance, what I would do is take one and, and do the short-term renewal from January 1st to March 31st. Don't take the rent increase for three months. Take it April 1st to, you know, to the end of the year and then start over with January 1st. So just, you, that's okay. If, if you have a six month renewal, oh well. But yeah, you're welcome to take it on either side. That's the only glitch with it. But, um, and then again, a whole 120 days. Then, but then it's much easier for you and your staff, obviously. The rent increase, the budget, the renewal, it's all on the same day for that project. Okay. And we're going to quickly talk about the new centralized mailbox. It's not real, real new anymore, but this is um, San Francisco's um, office, and you should have all gotten an email. I think it's been about six months ago. But anyway, the benefits are that it's very convenient. You just use, uh, you send us an email, um, PDF your documents, you know, uh, attach PDF documents, saves your money. You know, you don't have to run to the post office. There's no mail. Um, it's one address, so you don't even know, have to know who your project manager is. You just send it to that email address. Then, and also, um, uh, that's the customer service component of it because our HUD staff will log it and tickle the PM and, and, and distribute it to the proper PM and then tickle them and tickle their supervisor if it's getting a little close to being late and then if it's late. So it kind of keeps us honest too. Um, really, really good, good program. I love it. And there's, that's the picture of the email you should have gotten a while back. It says basically what I just said. Um, but that's, that's it. CA slash MF at HUD.gov. That's easy. Just send it to that. PDF files. You're done. You don't have to call anybody, anything. Um, a few caveats. Um, oh, it's, and here's how the format. So the, on the line item, put the request type the FHA or contract number and the project name. So it would be management cert, there's a project in Thompson Park, okay? That, that's your subject line. That's all you have to do. You don't have to put anything, you know, unless you want to say thank you, I like your hair, you know. Make it nice. 
And then this will, um, but to reduce email complication or duplication, just send that one. Don't send it and then copy your PM if you know who that is, one or the other, please. Because otherwise it's going to be logged and we're going to do it and then they're going to come back and say, you didn't do this. And it's like, yeah, we did. And it's kind of crazy for us. So one or the other, please. And, um, oh, and then project managers will continue with technical assistance. So this is just for <coughs> the bread and butter stuff. Your rent increase, um, 2530s, management certifications, things like that. If you're having trouble with tenants, if you have a question, anything like that, feel always email us, call us, okay? Um, but here, yeah, so I just said this is, and um, you can always still send it U.S. mail, but please don't do both, because then, again, it'd be duplications. You said don't do both? Don't, do not do both. Either use that, just quit using mail. Send it all to that, that website. I mean, that, that, that's what I like. A lot of us, too, are teleworking now. You know, I myself, I'm only here a few days a week, and so, you know, if you email it to me, and I, I then I have it at home, you know, I'm going to jump right on it. So, um, you know, that that's an advantage for you. You know, if it's if it's sitting in my mailbox and, and it came in on Friday, I'm not going to see it until, like, the following Tuesday, maybe, you know. And to order handbooks and forms and notices, there is an 800 number. It's been the same number since I've been with HUD, and I've been here for 24 years. It takes a month or two to get it because they send everything media mail. And it, you, does anybody actually print our handbooks anymore? I mean, they're like Bibles. They're huge, you know. So, um, but, you, but, you know, if you want a paper one, we'll still mail them out to you. No problem. In fact, you can order 10 copies if you want uh, to one address, right? But, or um, you can go on HUD Clips and everything, you can look at it. I, I have everything just like downloaded and, and um, well, not even downloaded. I've just got, got uh, what do you call the little things? Shortcuts. Favorites. Yeah, shortcuts. Thank you. Um, so I just have shortcuts to all the chapters that I use the most and, and uh, <laughs> save a few trees, folks. Okay. Questions? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So Robin, I just want to ask, uh, does HUD use the Appendix 5 in terms of um, calculating an increase similar to, to copy? Thank you for asking. Yeah, he asked um, if the if we use the Appendix 5 from 4350.1 for our analysis. Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. We do. Yeah, so exactly the same. And in fact, most of you are 202, so we, it will have a, we'll also use a zero vacancy factor. Zero. Mm-hmm. Do you have another question? Yeah, so just a clarification. You mentioned that um, if there's an increase in a, in a line item, yeah. you want an explanation of that. Mm-hmm. And um, does that apply to all increases or just the 5% and 500? Um, yeah, the question was, I, I said we want an explanation of all increases, and the question was, is it like Kahi where it's the, the 5% or 500 rule? Typically, we would like to see an explanation of anything that's an increase, but increase is kind of because it's HUD. It's not a contractor. You know, uh, Charles and his and his group, you know, are bound to a contract, and it's very, very stringent. And so they have to have much more stringent parameters. Um, if 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 we are comparing what you did last year and then the column three, like I said, that shows. You know, there's a variance of a percent or two, and that's what you have there. Um, then we're probably not going to question it. Um, but it's also real easy to just do a notation: five uh, percent uh, increase across the board for all of our uh, staff, for instance, and that would be for several line items. So, yeah, we really would like an explanation for all of them, just just a sentence or two. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have one that's just slightly off topic, and that's on renewals. Mm-hmm. If you have, say, nine years remaining on a half contract, and you're doing a recapitalization, oftentimes the lender or investor wants to see 10 years. If, you're, if you have that much time remaining, is it possible to get a one-year extension, or is HUD going to say, well, we will offer you a 20, or how would that work if it's necessary to kind of put the deal together and extend the affordability of the property and recapitalize it? Okay, the question was about the actual time frame for renewal, and this would obviously be for a half because PRACs are bound to one-year renewals still. 
Um, they're they're working with Congress, but that is a, literally an act of Congress to change that. So that you so PRAC folks, you're still on one year renewals. But in terms of a HAP, yes, it, especially. If, if you're recapitalizing with us through our production mm -hmm. with an FHA, you know, um, a product, you know, you can talk to your production person about that. But yes, I have seen that done. Okay. Yes. What, what they've done is we've right. just done three. Right. Is they actually want you to enter into a new 20-year contract. Right. So and that's good for everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So yes, we do. Typically, we want to see it. You know. Um, uh, that 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 you're committed to a 20-year co contract ultimately, and usually your mortgage company does too. So it, that's a win-win. But yes, it, just to, just to make things pencil, yes, I have seen special circumstances where where we you know do short-term renewals to align things. Yes. And in most cases, I mean, I, I personally would advocate doing a 20-year, but yeah. I just wasn't sure if there were ever cases where HUD would not want to do that. Um, we always want to do a 20-year. Renewal, we do. We we want we want the preservation, but um, and and especially uh, if 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 there's going to be um, insurance exposure, mm -hmm. meaning that you are coming in with an FHA model, we 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 are really all about the preservation. But like I said, if it was a situation to make things align or pencil, yes, they would do that short term if there was a commitment to affordability. Right. What that, if the affordability commitment was there, but the um, lender was a non-FHA, Cal HFA, for instance? Um, again, you, that would be a production question. Yeah. The question was, what if it was not an FHA deal? And like I said, that would be a production question. And uh, if you, and, and feel free, anybody that if you if you have these questions and don't have um, a uh, contact with our production staff, feel free to give me a call and I'll I'll uh, put that together for you. Okay. So, is there any other questions? Yes. So, say I'm adding a service coordinator, but I also have multi million dollars necessary to rehab. Mm -hmm. um, I know going over, say, what, like 10% here, the project manager has to you know, go higher up. Is there a certain level that the higher ups are going to cap at? Okay, the question, yeah, the question is um, if there's a recapitalization, you're talking about a PRAC. Okay, with a Pratt contract, if there's a recapitalization that would be over 10%, um, what? Yeah, it, it would definitely go beyond your project manager. You're correct. Um, what would they be looking for? I don't think it's necessarily as much the percentage, although you know the threshold would be the percentage. Anything over, not necessarily even just 10%, but um, what it would be more what the what it was for, you know. If it was 10% because you were recapitalizing the property, um, uh, we might want to look into a, a different way of doing that than just a rent increase. You know, there's other, depending on what the time frames, there may be other recapitalization products available. But in general, it's it's not a percentage. It's it, percentage. It's what needs to be done. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and also it'd be based on reasonableness. Uh, yeah. Yes. It, yeah. Reasonableness. What, yeah. Exactly. It would. It would depend on what you're doing and and when's the last time you did that and 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 uh, of course we'd probably want to come out. Uh, a lot of times things like that. It, if you had a um, if, if it's generated like by a React score, it's almost no question that we will you know work something where we bump up the. The uh, reserves or something on that that order to to address those absolutely. Okay. Any questions other than that? Yes. Given the risk, you basically for the crack, is it the same or similar for 236? Okay. The the question was, is it similar or same for 236? So you have, still have an old straight 236, no subsidy. That's really different. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, 236 is typically our specifically budget based, and we have, and, and they're all unique, and they each have their own formula for the the percentage of difference between the basic and the market rates of rent. That's um, in your your usually it's in your regulatory agreement. It's spelled out in your regulatory agreement. Sometimes there's a use agreement if it went through preservation back in the 1990s. Um, those are real um, unique animals, so work with your project manager on those. 
Any other questions? Rather just curious. Yeah. I noticed that the, the rents for a one bedroom and a two bedroom or any different types of bedroom in a frat uh -huh. are the same. Is, is that do you know what the reasoning is for that? Oh, okay. The question was in, in prax that the rents for one and two bedrooms are the same, and is there rationale for that? Um, not always. No. Uh, they're not always. Maybe yours are. A, I see that more with 811 properties, and I honestly can't tell you why, except that that's just how they you know they they uh, wrote them in, at the at the outset. Um, I have had a, I've never had a 202 that was like that, that had same rents, ones and two bedrooms, or, or, or efficiencies in one bedrooms. But I'm sure there are out there. Um, I have actually increased, you know, uh, the, on an 811 that had one and two bedrooms, I have actually increased the two bedrooms more than the one bedrooms, even though it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, insured with them the same, um, so it, that can change, okay. yeah. But it, it, again, budget-based, so it, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's, 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 it's it, it, you're, you, you can't get more. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, we want to apologize now for all the delay at the beginning. Uh, we will not make these mistakes uh, for our next one, so please feel free to come down and join us for our next training. If you have ideas, um, uh, just open up a yellow one of my yellow pad pieces of paper. If you have any ideas for upcoming training that you'd like to see us uh, provide as a free service um, here and on a webcast, just um, put your note on my uh, yellow pad paper in the back. Uh, again, thanks to Charles and Robin and uh, Davin. Um, I wish you all a good day. And for you on the webcast, uh, have a good day as well. Thanks.